Hi everyone, welcome to what will hopefully be the first episode of a series of recorded conversations with colleagues across the Penumbra team. Today we're delighted to be joined by Nick Bell, who's the Assistant Manager for the Edinburgh Crisis Centre. Um, and Nick, I wonder if I can just hand over to you to give us a bit of an introduction about what the centre is all about and what, what you guys do there. Thanks Fiona, thanks for having us along. Um, so yeah, the Edinburgh Crisis Centre opened in, in 2006, so we're into our, our 15th year now. Um, it's open to all Edinburgh residents who are aged 16 years and up. Um, and the idea is it's an alternate service to a statutory service for people to access support. Uh, people can contact us via the telephone helpline or via email. Um, initially, we can be anonymous if they wish to be. Uh, they don't have to give us any contact details. Uh, but to access sort of the other aspects of the service, we just need basic contact details like name, date of birth, address, things like that. Um, from there, we can offer people a face-to-face -face appointment in the centre, or we can also offer them a virtual appointment. Um, and both those aspects of the service run 24 hours every day of the year. Um, and even right through COVID times, we're, we've never had to sort of close the service at any point. Um, the idea is for people that are maybe feeling slightly distressed or feel that they're in crisis or approaching crisis point, uh, just to get that little bit of emotional support, maybe help them do a safe plan or a price, crisis plan. Firstly, to keep them safe in the here and the now, but also uh, to help them sort of move forward in, in how they're feeling. Um, first of all, you know, there are other services that you know, are listening services and, and people can speak to them just to talk through how they're feeling. Our approach is quite different in the fact that we will help people plan to move forward. And we have a very person-centered approach. Um, quite often when people contact us, obviously we listen to, to what they're saying, but it's also about uh, taking on board what they're saying and also letting them guide us in what they feel will be helpful. Um, we don't tell people what to do. We can make suggestions for people and um, offer them a little bit of guidance and let them choose from there what they feel would be the most appropriate approach. Um, and what you said there as well about people uh, being quite nervous or almost scared to contact a service is very true. Um, but we have found sort of, um, you know, with the service that it's not only people that have accessed mental health services that contact us, it's people that have maybe never contacted a service before. And when they do make that first contact, they are quite nervous. Um, but once they've made that first step, then, you know, with the support that we offer, it does build their confidence in, in, in helping them move forward and also perhaps accessing the service again. Um, our confidentiality policy is quite tight. We're not a statutory service, so we don't share information out with Penumbra. Uh, and I think people, once they realise that as well, um, that also kind of builds their confidence a little bit as well. The only time that we would break confidentiality is if, we believe that someone was at risk or there was a third party or animal or something like that at risk. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned there that you've been working all the way through lockdown, which must have presented some quite difficult challenges for, for yourself and the team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, you know, across the board here, nobody at any time to sort of plan for this. It just sort of came out of the blue. Um, one of the things that we did introduce quite quickly on was virtual appointments, um, which none of us have done before. Um, so once we got sort of around with the technology issues um, with that, um, we've found that those have been quite popular. Um, a lot of people are quite nervous about coming into a place that they're not familiar with during COVID times. So being able to get that sort of face-to-face -face support from home for people, you know, has been quite beneficial. Um, within the centre itself, um, obviously uh, the building's in quite a tenement building and these buildings were never designed for, for social distancing. Um, so that was a challenge as well. But we now have a completely COVID safe environment um, and we have sort of a one-way system throughout the centre for when people come in. Um, people have to wear a mask during appointment unless they're exempt. Um, but we just also want to reassure people that the building is completely COVID safe and mm -hmm. people shouldn't be concerned from that aspect about coming in for face-to-face -face support. And the other thing I was going to say actually was just to kind of, you know, at the risk of... Um you know, kind of uh, focusing on numbers um, rather than people, but your team supports around about 2,000 people each year um, across Edinburgh. Now, that's a, 
that's a, a significant chunk. Um, you know, you must be quite proud of that, but there must be challenges within that as well, you know, in terms of just kind of trying to get used to the COVID regulations and lockdown and reaching people as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, the guidelines with COVID change all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's just um, ensuring that that we follow all the updates um, that Penumbra advise each service with um, and, and putting those in place. Um, for example, we've just set up a resting room in the centre that was initially um, the reception room. And it's, you know, putting guidelines in place to make sure that the windows open during support time, that everything's cleaned down afterwards. Um, in the year prior to this, we had 464 people um, come into the centre. Uh, many of those had repeat visits. Obviously, that, those numbers have reduced a little bit. So at the moment, sort of one of our focuses, whether that's through social media, word of mouth, contacting services, is to make sure that people are aware that we're still open um, and getting the word out there that the support is still there for people. And that's really important, isn't it? Because with people more than, than ever feeling quite isolated and physically isolated, you know, that can be quite a, a challenge in kind of normal circumstances anyway, without a, a lockdown situation. So making sure that people know it's really important that people know that the service is there and they can still access it um, if they need to. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and I think that one thing that we've become aware of this year as well is that prior to COVID, a lot of people thought, uh, I'm never going to be affected by poor mental health or this will happen to me or it won't happen to my partner. And people are now beginning to realise that actually this is happening to everybody across the board. Um, and it's been able to know that what services are available, how to access them. I know that they can do it discreetly without it going A on the record, without people, you know, family members, friends knowing about it. Um, I know just myself or with, with friends and, and with colleagues, um, no matter how strong somebody thinks they are or how well that they manage their mental health, everybody is having a bad day or a bad week, and in some cases a little bit longer than that. Um, and it's important that people speak up and let somebody know how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And also as well, sometimes we can notice changes in other people. Um, you know, you can notice, if it's someone you live with, for instance, you can notice maybe their sleeping habits or their eating habits have changed. Or if it's a friend or a colleague, it's sometimes it looks like they've become a little bit withdrawn or they're a little bit quieter than normal. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is, is to be able to ask somebody are you feeling okay or you don't seem yourself at the moment mm -hmm. um so it's important for people to sort of realize that it is okay to ask and also to to you know not necessarily challenge people but to point out as well i know you're saying things are okay but we ha i have noticed that you know you don't seem yourself or things like that and it may well be somebody is just having a day, bad day and they'll feel a little bit better the next day but it's always good to say to people that, you know, I am here to, to listen to you if you want to, or, or here's a number um, that you can call if you want to speak to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, we had someone on the phone the other week who was concerned about their partner, um, but didn't think that he would call a service. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd suggested that maybe she just tells him about the service and, and leave our phone number on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And he may or may not call. And he did call. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes it's important for people to, you know, maybe go away, think about things a little, a little bit. Um, and we know with men in particular that they're less likely to speak up or, or speak to look for support. Um, you know, there's, uh, I think it's three times more likely that a, a man will complete a suicide plan than a woman. And that's based on the fact that they don't speak up and they don't seek support. And sometimes, as you say, you made that important point about the fact that it could be as simple as, because I think sometimes as friends and loved ones, you're almost quite um, reticent about, you know, raising the subject with someone that you love because you don't know, you're maybe scared to say the wrong thing or you think you're going to be a bit awkward about it, but it maybe can just be as simple as, even although you're, you're not able to provide professional support, but just starting that conversation and saying to someone, are you okay? How are you feeling today? You know, and that, that the, just those kind of small things might be enough to, I, I guess, encourage that person maybe to, to reach out, as you mentioned that example there with 
um, the couple. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it's it's starting. And once you get that ball rolling, so to speak, then things can become a little bit easier. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, when someone makes that first call to us, for instance, they can be very nervous. They're not sure what to expect. And, you know, when they hang up and they go away and they think about it, nine times out of 10, people are happier that they've had someone to speak to. They feel that sort of, you know, a little bit of a burden has maybe been lifted off their shoulders and then they'll throw this back again. Mm-hmm. Or that they have a plan that they can then refer to. They have strategies in place, some coping mechanisms. Um, and once all of that starts, it does make that recovery process a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I was quite curious to, to talk about just um, with you today, Nick, was the fact that, because I know a lot of people are very kind of um, nervous about, you know, talking about suicide in an open way and actually using the word suicide. Um, and we know from research that's been carried out that, you know, it's not saying the word suicide and having that open conversation isn't a trigger for that. Do you think people are um, becoming a bit more used to saying that word and having those conversations? Or do you think that that is just something that we're kind of on the brink of? And, you know, I think maybe have now that we've had more, more of a kind of focus on mental health throughout lockdown, do you think that's a, a kind of one more step in the right direction to having those open conversations about mental health and suicide and suicide prevention? Yeah, um, it's quite strange in, in the fact that it's been a, a year of COVID and all of that's been very difficult for lots of people, but there has been positives in that, in the fact that a lot of more people now are speaking up about their mental health. Mm. Um, a lot more people are realizing that this can happen to me um, or it can happen to somebody that I know and somebody that I love. Um, I think that, you know, there used to be sort of a lot of misconceptions that this would never happen to me. It won't happen to anyone I know. It only happens to people who are really depressed. Um, Sort of all of those type of misconceptions. And now people are beginning to realize that it can happen to everybody, Mm -hmm. everyone. Um, And I think as well, if you're having a bad day, that's fair enough, and you can write it off as that. But once you begin to have a couple of bad days, or you feel that you're sinking into that hole a little bit more, that's when you can head towards a crisis point. So from a preventative point of view, that's always good to seek support before you actually hit that crisis point. Um, some of our calls are people that are maybe just finding the last couple of days difficult, and they get that little bit of reassurance, and they put a plan in place. And that could prevent them from sort of uh, things escalating for them. Mm. Um, you know, I think that um, a lot of people think as well that when somebody does complete their suicide plan, that, you know, that it's something that's maybe been building up over a period of time. And quite often in cases, that is true. Mm. But, you know, there's also people that have a, a particularly bad week or so, and that's when it happens because very quickly they can't see a way out. So it is important to speak up as soon as you sort of notice any changes in yourself. Or if somebody approaches you and says to you, I've noticed maybe you're not yourself just now, to to maybe go away and think about that and and see if you feel that you need a little bit of support. And I suppose the other thing is as well, it kind of, um, as you say, for people who have maybe never you know lived with mental ill health or mental health issues or they've never experienced anxiety or depression or, or any of those things for a lot of people they're probably finding or they potentially are finding that lots of external factors you know financial home life relationship issues and all those sorts of things that maybe have been there in the background but are now becoming exacerbated or or worse because of lockdown, it's just become almost like a sort of perfect storm for, you know, creating, um, you know, difficulties for, for people. I wonder if then in that circumstance, I wonder if that's made us think a bit more about, you know, self-care and, you know, almost kind of like that idea that the ultimate act of self-care is making time in your day and your week for, you know, your, your mental health and your well-being and looking after yourself. So whether that is, you know, self-care through reading a book or just making some time to have a little bit of, you know, time to do stuff that, that you like. Um, 
do you think that that's something that people will now kind of focus on a bit more and they'll kind of prioritise their mental health a bit more in that way? Yeah, um, I, I think that it is, and I would hope that it would be. I think it's important to, every so often in your day, allocate yourself 10 minutes just to do something that you want to do. And whether, well, we can't sit outside at the moment, but whether that's, you know, in the springtime, sitting in the garden with a cup of coffee, or, you know, even if you're watching a program, even if it's just to sit down and watch 10 minutes of it, or as you said, you know, to read a book, or, you know, there's things as well that I've noticed adults are reverting back to lots of things they did when they were kids, like coloring in books, uh, Lego, jigsaws, you know, things like that. Anything that you enjoy that takes your, your focus away from everything else that's going on around you. And that doesn't even need to be when you're feeling down or anything like that. Even just on a normal day, to every so often allocate yourself 10 minutes just to do something that you enjoy to relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you will find at the end of the day, if you've done that two or three times throughout the day, you may not feel kind of as anxious or as stressed as you would do if, rather than just powering through the day. Um, we do know that, you know, it's always good to battle on and, and, and things like that, but it's also good to take that time out and step away from every situation. Working from home, for instance, as well, you know, that's been a huge challenge for lots of people. Uh, and it's very difficult to sort of change your environment. So being able to step away from where you're sitting working and going and sitting in another room with a cup of coffee, a bit of coloring in, or plan that you're going to cook for your meal that night. Anything like that is a, is a positive thing. And it all sounds very basic and, and very simple, but when you are sort of powering through things or you are feeling that your mental health is changing, sometimes it's really difficult to remember just those simple things that, that do actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, It's always good to allocate yourself to, I know, five or ten minutes, but also as well to take other little breaks in between if you feel that you need it. Um, you know, so... It, it, and I guess that the point as well is that, you know, because I, I suppose, I mean, we say it all the time when we're, we're having these conversations, but that gone are the days when people would kind of, you know, not relate to themselves as, as having mental health. But these days we know that we all have mental health and, you know, at times it can be good and at times it can be bad. And, you know, in the same way that we look after our physical health, we have to kind of make the effort to, to kind of allocate some time to look after our mental well-being as well. Yeah, and I think that's a good point as well, Fiona, that people, you know, are more aware of mental health now, and I think that that's something that will come through in, in younger generations. Um, younger generations, hopefully, will will sort of are becoming now and will continue to grow in an environment where it is okay to talk about how you're feeling. Mm. Um, where sort of the older generations still struggle to talk openly about how they're feeling. I know my parents' generation was like, "Well, just get on with it." And you know, th that's not the case. Mm. You do have to talk about it. And you do have to take time out for yourself. Mm. One of the things that we um, we always talk about a lot at uh, at Penumbra is hope and the importance of hope. Um, and I just wanted to kind of get a feel from you about um, what you think about why you think it's it's so important to have hope in in, in recovery. Okay. Well, I mean, firstly, hope is real. You know, it, it is there. It's there for everybody. Um, and it's things like sort of, you know, reminding yourself that you can be a strong person, you can get through this. Importantly, things can and will change. Um, and it's just a matter of being able to get yourself onto that track with the support and the support that all of the Penumbra services provide and utilizing that support to your best of your ability. Um, hope is what is going to get you through that difficult period. Hope is going to what is going to make you go through your recovery period. And people also have to remember recovery is different for everybody. There's no correct road to go down. There's no correct challenge. But just having those sort of positive affirmations, reminding yourself that you are strong, you can do it, you use the support networks around you. And also to remember that there's no kind of right or wrong way in, in moving forward. It's different for every individual. But certainly hope is what's going to get you through. And as I said at the beginning there, it's there for everybody. And that's a wonderful, hopeful uh, note to finish on, Nick. Um, it's been a, a delight to talk to you today and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Bye. Thanks for having me, Fiona. Cheers. Bye. Right, that's fine.